All right. Uli, Arlen, do we have you both? Still good to go. All right. I'm here. All right, very good. I'm just going to have, um, and we are broadcasting, and we're starting to get attendees joining us for this webinar. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. We're just going to do a quick sound check with our previous panelists before we go ahead and get started at 2 o'clock Eastern. Dr. Myers, would you mind uh, please loudly saying your name and title, please? Hi, this is Dr. Arlen Myers. I'm the president and CEO of the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs, and thanks for joining us. Very good. I can hear you loud and clear. And Dr. Chetapali, would you please do the same? Sure. This is Yuli Chetapali. I'm a physician and innovator. I'm here in San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, looking forward to chatting with you all. Very good. I can hear you loud and clear. I'm just going to check the chat for any, uh, any issues that our participants are um, experiencing, and we'll get started in about 30 seconds. We already have 30 people on the line. That we do. That we do. You guys are popular. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> they, want the right. free, they want the free t-shirt. <laughs> there you go. Mm -hmm. the, the connector t-shirt. All right, guys. Um, volume up. Yes, thank you for the feedback. We'll go ahead and uh, um, I'm going to advise for Dr. Chetapali, Dr. Myers to speak into their microphones um, as clearly as they can throughout the presentation. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, and I just want to thank everyone for joining us for uh, today's webinar on artificial intelligence, how it will change the practice of medicine. My name is Ryan Chancoco. I'm with uh, the Physician's Edge, and I'll serve as your moderator for today. And I have the pleasure of uh, introducing our two presenters. Um, you heard their voices. Um, this doctor, that's Dr. Uli Chetapali, a physician innovator, author, and speaker. Um, Dr. Chetapali is also a researcher and uh, um, was chief technology officer at Crest Network, very much an innovator in the Bay Area, um, and an author of a book called Punish the Machine, which he'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, it is available on Amazon, and his website is innovatormd.com. So, Dr. Chetapali, thank you for joining us today. Um, our co-presenter, Dr. Myers, Arlen Myers, um, an influencer, an author, and the president and CEO, Society of Physician Entrepreneurs, one of my favorite people, a great mentor to our organization. Uh, Dr. Myers was, is uh, an active professor at the University of Colorado in Denver, um, and it'd take me about an hour to go through his bio, so I'll let you all just kind of read it there, and feel free to connect with him on LinkedIn, wonderful connection to have. Uh, and same goes for Dr. Chetapali, of course. Um, but I won't spend a, a, a ton of time kind of going through the bios of our presenters here, folks. We're talking about AI in medicine. So I'm going to go ahead uh, and turn it over to the, these gentlemen shortly. But before I do, any questions, thoughts, comments that you have, please, um, please add them to the chat function of our Zoom platform here. And we'll go ahead and have Dr. Myers and Dr. Chetapali um, address them at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, gentlemen, I'm going to go ahead and turn the mic over to you, Dr. Myers. Thanks very much. And uh, then again, thanks for everyone joining us. And I hope uh, you enjoy this presentation. As, as Ryan said, we're going to talk for about 20 minutes and then have a little more of a conversation. So let's start off with trying to sort out some of the confusion about actually the definition of artificial intelligence, machine learning, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, Uli, uh, from your perspective, what is artificial intelligence? Uh, thanks, Arlen. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks, Ryan. Um, it's a pleasure to be on this podcast. Um, so if you look up the definition of artificial intelligence, it, it usually compares the intelligence of machines to the intelligence of human beings. And that's why, you know, the, the word artificial is there, you know, meaning that the natural intelligence is coming from human beings, whereas the machines have artificial intelligence. And so they have, uh, the artificial in, intelligence in general has, you know, several subcategories, you know, machine learning, natural language processing, deep learning, and all those things. But the main, uh, the way I look at it is you have these inputs coming in, whether they are sound, visual, or data coming in, 
And then there's the processing happening in the machine, and you have the output. And the output could be any kind of action, you know, whether it is data, whether it is, um, you know, uh, giving an insight to the human beings. And so, uh, although artificial intelligence is very far, far from um, getting close to human intelligence, uh, but uh, there's a lot of uh, advantages uh, that uh, human beings can uh, get from it, especially in the healthcare field. So um, we've heard a lot, and it has to do with the definition that, you know, some people are saying, oh, artificial intelligence is going to replace doctors. And the other side says, no, 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 no. Artificial is really augmented intelligence designed to scale doctors. Uh, what's your view? Uh, it depends on what uh, kind of work the doctor is doing. Uh, if the doctor is doing clerical work, yes, you know, it'll replace that work. But if the doctor is doing much uh, a higher level of function, you know, for example, you know, critical thinking, whether it is uh, showing empathy, communicating and understanding the situation for the patient, uh, all those functions, they cannot be replaced uh, by machines, at least, I would say, in the, another 100 years. So I would not worry too much about machines replacing doctors. But if you are in a function where it is a rote function, which is repeated over and over again, and which involves, um, you know, visual uh, stimuli, you know, like you know, the radiology or pathology, or dermatology, where you're looking at images all the time, uh, there, you know, obviously the, the rote function will be replaced. But the thinking part uh, and uh, assessing the situation and showing empathy all those things will still be done by doctors, uh, human beings, I would say. So which specialties, and it seems like there's a question, wh which specialists are most likely today to be impacted by artificial intelligence? And I guess specifically I'm referring to such things as computer vision and pattern recognition and all those sorts of things. So if, if, you're, if you're a dermatologist, a pathologist, a radiologist, should you be worried? Uh, no, I would not be worried, um, but I would uh, learn, you know, how the technology works because this technology will assist physicians in how they do their job, uh, mainly because uh, artificial intelligence, the technologies have the capacity to look at large uh, volumes of data, large number of images, and uh, try to understand the patterns. And so it does, you know, enhance a physician's uh, work, especially the radiologists, pathologists, and, and dermatologists. Um, but the key is that, you know, the work will change, definitely change, uh, hopefully for the better, um, mainly because, you know, then the quality of, uh, you know, the care that they are providing will hopefully improve. Uh, we have seen some signs of that uh, where, you know, the accuracy keeps getting better over time um, from these uh, machines. Um, the, uh, the world of cyber intelligence really places uh, some challenges in front of medical education, whether it's at the pre-med level, the medical school level, the special, uh, you know, the practice level. And some people say that we don't really need data scientists to understand all this. On the other hand, people say, well, physicians are pretty far behind the curve when it comes to data literacy and understanding, you know, how artificial intelligence works. So how does a practitioner who may be at various stages of their career learn about this stuff? Where do they go and what do they do and what do they really need to know? Well, I would say the first thing would be to improve the educational system where you know, uh, the quantitative sciences, you know, whether it is statistics, whether it is math, and you know, whether it's data science, I think it needs to be introduced uh, uh, at a much earlier level uh, in, in the education system, whether it is uh, uh, medical schools or, or even training. Um, the key is that physicians may not need to know how to code, but they need to understand how it works. 
I think that's, that's the key, understanding how it works, and maybe even help the data scientists and the engineers um, figure out some of the things, because obviously uh, uh, the importance of having domain knowledge is key to uh, developing systems that are useful and that are helpful and hopefully you know, make, a, make a difference in the patient's lives and then the physician's lives. So I would say physician involvement, uh, whether it is self-learning or through formal education is very important in, in, in this field. And they need to partner with, with the technologists, uh, obviously, you know, uh, the technologists definitely need uh, domain uh, uh, knowledge people uh, when they are developing these uh, solutions. So how will, in your experience, or the things that you've worked on, AI help clinicians? Um, so uh, my first experience uh, with technology was in uh, Kaiser Permanent Day, where I was a uh, emergency physician and also a researcher. Um, that's where I kind of got my first taste of how technology uh, can help practice. Um, around 2005 or so, um, you know, uh, the organization went through a major shift into electronic health records. Um, we have 21 hospitals in Northern California, and all of them became paperless over the next few years. Uh, that's when we, 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 were, we were doing small studies, and then we realized that, oh my God, there's so much data that is being collected in the electronic health record, uh, how can we use that to obtain new knowledge and maybe even help the physicians in their workflows and, and in their decision making? Uh, that's when myself and another physician, we joined together and started uh, uh, this network called uh, CREST Network. Um, it's mainly a research organization uh, within the organization, and uh, we invited all the physicians who are interested in doing research uh, into this group. Uh, we got some grants, uh, and um, I was, uh, since I had a little bit of technology knowledge uh, before that, I became the technology lead, um, and we built a platform that would uh, sit on top of the electronic health record, be able to access the data from the health record, uh, in real time, analyze it, and uh, be able to provide feedback to the physicians while they are seeing the patient uh, in the clinic, in the, in the emergency department, in real time at the point of care. Um, so that's how I got my first taste of um, how data is, it can be used to uh, uh, come up with solutions uh, come up with new knowledge and be able to apply that immediately in the real world. Um, although we didn't use machine learning, but that's the next step that uh, that needs to be done. And then I realized that, oh, okay, uh, and I see the developments outside. Um, and I've, I've partnered with uh, several other groups from MIT and uh, Stanford and started looking at at the solutions that can be created to inform the decision-making of physicians. And that's my main interest. And, and I see that there's a lot of potential there. So and you and I have had experience in working with technologists and multiple elements of the ecosystem, whether it's digital health or AI. And I have a saying that, you know, physicians are from Venus and technologists are from Mars. <laughs> we, we, we simply pe talk past each other because of a number of reasons. Uh, so can you, in, in what you just described, in, in the collaboration of clinicians with technologists or informaticists, what was the single biggest challenge? Huh. Uh, well, there, obviously there are many challenges. Uh, the single biggest challenge is, uh, I would say convincing people, uh, when I say people, it's, it's uh, you know, convincing the leadership that there is value here and that this is something that needs to be done. Um, so when we first proposed this in 2010, you know, it was very early. Uh, obviously, many people did not know what 
how, how can technology help, you know, other than EHRs, they have not seen uh, any other tools that actually can help in their practice or in the outcomes of patients. And so I think, you know, getting that support from, uh, from the top um, is a critical element uh, in, in getting these kinds of projects going, because obviously you need all the support you can get financially, uh, you know, whether it is uh, creating that space, creating that entity, creating that uh, opportunity to be able to do the work. I think that's, that's the biggest uh, okay. and, uh, hurdle. And, and so let's talk about the barriers to, uh, let's go to the next slide and talk about the barriers to AI dissemination and implementation. Um, we've written a little bit about this and sort of characterized them in a couple of different dimensions. One are technical issues, another are human factors issues, another are um, ethical and you know, social policy issues. Um, from your perspective, again, wh what is the single biggest barrier to AI dissemination and implementation? And, and, it, and so, have you done yeah. some work to overcome it? Because you've obviously been working in the Kaiser system for a while. Yeah, so I, uh, I, I, I've been out of the Kaiser system for six months, seven months now. In January, I, I came out. Um, and I've been exploring and looking at other companies, how they are doing, where they are and uh, in that journey. Um, uh, and, and kind of, you know, helping companies understand where they need to go eventually. Um, so the barrier, when you talk about barriers, I think the biggest barrier in the U.S. is uh, the business model of healthcare. I think that is the biggest barrier. So, for example, if you are in a fee-for-service world, you are paid by the task that you do, uh, whether you're a physician or a nurse or what, uh, whoever. Right. If if so, one of the biggest uh, uh, driver of income for for people and for healthcare companies for hospitals is that doing more things. So if you admit more patients, the hospital you know gets the revenue. If the pay if the physician sees more patients, they get uh, uh, reimbursed um, more. Uh, whereas in a value based care system, is the business model is exactly the opposite. Uh, here in the fee service system, uh, the companies and individuals make money when the patient is sick. Uh, in the value-based care system, they make money when the patient is healthy. Um, so so the, the incentives are not aligned uh, in the sense that where technology can help uh, maybe improve the processes, maybe increase the efficiency, maybe decrease the cost, maybe improve the outcomes uh, for these patients. And so that's where I think the biggest hurdle is. Um, but that may be changing. There, there is, you know, slow trends where, you know, healthcare companies are trying to get into value-based care. Um, and, and again, the value-based care, I'm, I'm not talking about the specifics of, uh, you know, what the CMS says. I'm talking about, you know, taking on the whole risk for that patient population, where you are responsible for the for everything that happens to that patient, then you start to think about, oh, how can I make this efficient? How can I uh, build a knowledge base where we find that which treatment works best to prevent, you know, maybe heart attacks, maybe strokes, um, and so those kinds of things will be built into it, and because artificial intelligence is able to predict outcomes, you will have an opportunity to change those outcomes by controlling the factors that are going into uh, making that outcome happen. So that's where I feel the biggest barrier is. Of course, there are multiple other barriers that, as you have uh, beautifully described um, in, in, your, uh, in your blog post, and all those are real, but this is the biggest one. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. Um, so obviously, uh, for this to work, uh, there's going to require a lot of patient education, physician education, 
And fundamentally, in my view, if we're going to move sick care to health care, it's going to require changing doctor and patient behavior at a minimum, as well as other stakeholders. So do you think patients are really ready for this? Um, I, uh, and that's a good question. Uh, the question is, uh, if you think about knowledge, right, uh, medical science as a knowledge, it comes from, let's say, the books, the, the research that happens in the, 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 the medical schools, and it, it, it is imparted to the doctors. And it's the doctors that use that knowledge to impart that to patients. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, whatever tools we build, whatever technology uh, that can extract this knowledge, it doesn't necessarily have to go to the patient first. You know, it has to go to the doctors because where I see the biggest bang for the buck is where when we are dealing with these big ticket items, um, you know, like heart attack, stroke, cancer, uh, you know, um, musculoskeletal uh, uh, problems, which are very, very expensive in, in the current healthcare system. Now, if you, take, if you go to the other end, which is the minor stuff, where you know, the, maybe the patient doesn't have to go to the uh, clinic or the hospital, but may be able to take care of it at home, um, those are the, so that's the other end, uh, where the minor uh, urgent care, you know, the colds and the coughs and you know, those kinds of minor injuries that can be taken at care at home. That can be also useful for the patient. So the patients are ready. You know, they want convenience. They want quick answers, and they want low cost, right? But there's, yeah, and, but there's, uh, as, as the slide we see indicates, uh, there's a lot of potential for DIY AI and so-called patient consumerization and democratization, but it's fraught with all kinds of perils. So that seems to be a pretty big leap. I, that's why I said I think it'll happen at the lower end first where you know minor problems minor medical issues can be taken care of um, minor uh, issues with you know chronic care management okay should i change my dose of uh, you know pain medicine uh, insulin you know, those kinds of things i think that can be automated um, based on how well the patient can respond to the system by feeding in data um, so a lot of the chronic conditions can be uh, at least at the first level before they hit the nurse or the call center or the urgent care can be taken care at the lower end of the spectrum. And, okay. and patients are ready for it. Yeah, let's go to the next slide. Um, or the next question. Um, so even if the patients were, uh, or how will Elliot, yeah, let's go back to that one, number four. How, even if the patients are willing and able to use AI, what's the use case? I mean, why would they do this and what's the value proposition and incentive to do it? Um, so like I said, uh, accessibility, cost, uh, and convenience. Those are the three things that the patients value most. Um, Not quality. quality. Yes, quality, you know, because, you know, one of the things, uh, I think the quality is mostly rests on the physicians to take care of uh, and to be able to educate their patients about the quality piece because patients are getting this stuff, you know, from the internet and, and you know, that's where, you know, the, the difficulty is. That's the reason why physicians need to lead this effort. Physicians need to uh, learn this and be able to teach it to the patients to say, hey, you know, this is what I recommend you do, or this is the, you know, uh, app I want you to download, or this is the website that I want you to follow. Um, and be, and make that a, as a seamless thing. So the first level would be, you know, they follow the instruction of, of the app. The second level would be, you know, where a nurse can take the call. A third level would be you can bring them into the urgent care clinic. 
you know, and the fourth level would be, you know, where, you know, you, a specialist need to see the patient. So if you, if you can uh, filter that way, you know, as, as depending on the severity of the condition, depending on, the, uh, uh, on how bad the situation is, you can move the patient up, up this ladder. Um, you know, that's how you control the cost and quality. Okay, let's move to the next question. Um, so from the industry perspective, and of course there's a lot of stakeholders in the industry, um, how will AI change or how is AI changing the healthcare industry? And, and by that specifically, I mean, you know, we've all heard of the triple aim, the, quad, the, the quadruple aim, the quintuple aim, basically quality cost, equitable access, patient experience, doctor experience, business process optimization. So we've all heard about the potential to do all that stuff, but do you see real evidence that any of this has been accomplished yet? Um, yeah, good question. So uh, I, think, I think the biggest change that will happen, that will drive all these other things, is knowledge. Um, in the past, well, e even now, we don't have access to a lot of knowledge, a lot of evidence. I would say half of what we do in healthcare is not evidence-based because there's no evidence. Uh, there's no data. There's no, um, there's, there's no studies that show that what one physician is doing, you know, will have a good outcome. Um, but now, now that we are collecting data, now that we have everything uh, computerized, digitized, and now we can study large amounts of data, uh, now you can know which particular patient needs which kind of treatment which will lead to the best outcome. So one of the big changes that will happen is that, you know, as this knowledge gets more and more propagated, the 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 work of physician will change because based on you know previously it used to be okay you go to medical school you learn from the textbooks and from your practical rotations but that's all you know where you learn right of course you learn from your practice but then you're not sure that's your your own practice maybe you have seen 100 patients like that what if, what if we give you the knowledge of 100,000 patients? And that's exactly what we did at uh, Crest Network. We took, you know, for example, there was a study for chest pain. And, you know, when a patient comes and walks into the emergency, you know, when they have chest pain, you do an EKG, you run lab tests, you take a history. But all that information, imagine if you have access to 100,000 patients that have all come into the emergency with chest pain and you have that data and you know how they did uh, as, as far as outcomes are concerned. Now you can figure out, okay, what are the important steps for this particular patient, uh, for this specific patient? So that kind of knowledge, it immediately improves what, what tests you're gonna run, right? And a lot of tests are useless tests. You know, a lot of treadmill tests that we do, a lot of observation, a lot of, uh, so those kinds of excessive testing, excessive admissions, excessive uh, follow-up procedures will all go down. Uh, once you figure, figure, once you have the knowledge of which ones will work. And so that I think will impact the businesses. So they, obviously the, the, the businesses that will go into value-based care will be the ones with the best technology and with the best tools and with the best staff will be the winners. And so Dr. that is Yeah, Dr. Uh, I'm going to ask, ask you, the gentleman, to move to the Q&A portion. We've got about uh, a handful of questions here. And in, uh, in the interest of time, I was hoping you don't mind that we move. Yeah, sure. Uh, let's, uh, let's answer the questions. Yeah, so sure. um, first question is kind of back to something you guys mentioned earlier about physicians and technologists working together as partners. Uh, how can physicians and technologists partner? Um, there's, a techno there's a technologist actually on with us. What's a good way for them to build that kind of rapport uh, and to build kind of great tools collectively? 
Um, well, there's always this, I mean, that's, it's a complicated question, particularly for intrapreneurs. In other words, physician, employed physicians trying to act like entrepreneurs in their organization. And I believe there was another question submitted. So how do you get the leaders to buy in? Yep. How do you get yep. the technologists to buy in? How do you get, you know, and, and there's actually a long list of, you know, survival skills for intrapreneurs. But I would say um, <laughs> this is about leading change. And fundamentally, there's a, there's a multi-step process. I would stress that the first step, as John Cotter uh, indicated, was creating a sense of urgency. So if I'm going to leave you with one point, it's going to be not necessarily what are we going to do or how are we going to do it. You have to convince the stakeholders why you need to change. And so therefore, you need to build a convincing argument that the status quo is unsatisfactory and doesn't meet your needs. That's probably the biggest challenge that entrepreneurs have. Why should we do this? Why should we overcome the resistance to change? Why isn't what we're doing now working, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Willie, what is what's your take on that? That's that's I totally agree with that. Um, creating a sense of urgency, and also uh, understanding what is happening in the market, what is happening in the industry, and you can see the trends, right? You know, the cost keeps going up. Uh, you know, now we are almost at you know twenty percent of the G GDP. You know, we are spending on healthcare, and, and you know, at at some point that's that's going to crack. Um, where you know patients are going bankrupt because of healthcare, you know, costs, uh, and so companies have to figure that out. So it's going to happen, but bringing that knowledge back to the leaders and, and convincing them of the urgency for for change, I think that that will that can work. Okay. The other thing I would say is we're looking at a very slow process. There was a question, you know. How long is it going to take to work? Is it going to work? What can we expect? There's something called a 30-year rule, which basically means a, an evolving ecosystem for any industry typically takes a generation or two. So don't expect mm. this to happen overnight. And oh, by the yeah. way, when something is discovered in medicine, it typically takes 17 to 20 years to diffuse such that it becomes the standard of care. So we're in the hype cycle, and you just have to be patient with this. Yes, I agree totally. This next question for Dr. Chetapali came up a couple of times. You mentioned doctors should get better at learning, understanding the technology, particularly AI. If you were advising, say, uh, new residents or new physicians to your healthcare system, where is the where are the first couple of places they should go, and what should they be learning from the get-go? Sure. Um, well, I would say you should join SOAP, Society of Physician Entrepreneurs, which uh, Dr. Ar Arlen Meyer, Arlen, Arlen Meyer runs, uh, and I'm a part of that also in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, the main thing is you have to understand what's happening at the, at, at the front edge of uh, innovation. So once you get that idea, then you go back and start learning things. Um, so online courses are, are there, you know, you, you just have to understand the basics unless, you, you know, you're really into programming and, and or statistics or mathematics. Then, of course, you can go deep. But uh, most physicians should be able to understand, you know, the basics of statistics and basics of, of uh, uh, data science. And once you do that, and, and in your organizations, depending on the size of your organizations, you know, you should find out where the change is happening, where which, which groups are working on new things that are going to change in the future. Uh, and so you join those things um, and work with them. And if you, are, if you are a freelancer, you can always join a startup. Yeah, I would say um, that, actually, I would say that if you're interested in, in physician entrepreneurship and more specifically digital health entrepreneurship and more specifically what I call entrepreneurship, AI entrepreneurship, education is the least important part of your pathway. You're going to need not just education, but resources, networks, mentors, experience, peer-to-peer -peer support, and non-clinical career development. And most importantly, you need to get out of your network box. You need to expand mm. and create robust external networks. You will not find the innovation in medicine 
You will find it in aerospace, in telecom, in cable, in consumer electronics, in nanotechnology. There's just so much collision of industries. You're not going to find innovation at your next medical meeting. <laughs> That's, a, that's, that's an absolutely true. great point. I'm going to see if two more questions here, guys, before we turn it over. Uh, this one's an interesting one, and I'm interested to get both your takes on this. Which medical specialties will be most changed by technology in the next 10 years? Dr. Chetapali, we'll have you uh, answer first. Uh, can you repeat that question, please? Which medical specialties um, do you think will be most changed by technology in the next 10 years? Hmm. Wow. I can answer that uh, one if you want to think about it, uh, Uli. Uh, Go ahead. Yesterday, yesterday, I gave a presentation to someone who's involved in the pathology world, hospital pathologists. And I will tell you that right now, probably the specialties that are being impacted the most are radiology, because again of pattern recognition and computer vision. Radiology, pathology, dermatology, and ophthalmology, particularly when it comes to AI-driven retinal scans. So if, if you're in a specialty that primarily depends on visual diagnosis, you are presently being impacted by these technologies. And many, many studies have demonstrated that the machine is a lot better than you are at making the diagnosis. I, I totally agree. That's, that's the first step. The second piece uh, I would say which will change or impact are the ones which the specialties that do a lot of procedures, I would say that that will change very fast um, because this, this uh, technology can, will be able to tell which ones exactly need what procedures and when. And we know that a lot of procedures don't um, you know, you know, provide optimum outcomes, especially the, the high procedure in you know, like spine surgery, uh, you know, cardiac cath and things like that, I think that will change uh, very soon. It already has, and I'll give you an example. Intermountain Health in Utah uh, identified that back pain, for the most part, doesn't need to be treated. And if you wait in the large majority of cases four weeks without doing anything, most people will get symptomatic relief with, you know, minor uh, analgesics. So they and they determined this basically through some AI technology, and they instituted a rule that said that if you see a patient with back pain, we don't want you to order an MR, MR until four weeks after you see the patient. Now there are exceptions and there are rules and every patient's different. But the point is that to, all, to Uli's point, diagnostic accuracy, diagnostic prediction is already impacting how we practice medicine for almost every specialty. Yeah. All right. Last question, guys. And, and uh, I want to thank a, a few folks who submitted questions ahead of time. I know we can't get to everything, so I'm going to uh, try to convince our, our, our friends here to maybe address them in a blog or a separate podcast. But thanks to David uh, in advance for this question. Um, AI is really heating up in the med tech space. Competition is fierce. Uh, just on medical imaging alone, you have dozens of competing companies. Uli and Arlen, what are your take on collaborations domestically and globally, perhaps creating ecosystems that combine different functions, CT, MRI, ECGs, um, that, val that provide more value to patients? Would love for you to comment on those. Arlen, we'll go ahead and have you comment first, please. Um, so in my travels, I, I spend time in drug discovery, med tech, digital health, et cetera, and I can tell you the single biggest question that med tech and pharma are trying to figure out is the role of digital health in their industry. And uh, they just have, it has everything to do with physician engagement, it has to do with designing their products, it has to do with customer engagement, et cetera, et cetera. They're, they're still in midstream, they're still trying to figure it out. But to the point of the ecosystem, I think, and hospitals are, are kind of overwhelmed with the number of siloed ideas being thrown over the transom. So ultimately, and this is part of the reason why this ecosystem is gonna take a while to develop, there needs to be a cyber brain that coordinates all of this stuff into what's called a whole product solution. And just piecemealing it and throwing individual silo applications at people, is that's where we are now, but that's not where we're going. 
So the answer to the question is MedTech is trying to figure it out. BioPharm is trying to figure it out. And frankly, cable is trying to figure it out. So all these other industries want to get a piece of digital health. They just don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. Totally, totally agree. I think one piece I would throw in there is that I can see that internationally, there's much more uh, rapid pace of development, mainly because there are not as many barriers as we see in the U.S. And uh, some of the some of the systems are are doing much. Uh, they are much further in the work, uh, mainly because you know they they have a single payer system or where the payer is responsible for the outcomes, uh, and, and so they are trying to figure out how to best. Uh, deploy technology uh, to improve the outcomes. And we're seeing reverse innovation a lot. In other words, innovation from third world emerging companies, India, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East, where they have very limited resources. People don't have money to spend on an AI system. And so they concoct mm. ideas that are pretty ingenious that satisfy large populations. And the idea is to translate that to the United States. So all this doesn't cost a fortune. One of the questions was, well, how the heck does a rural hospital afford an AI clinical decision support system? Yeah, absolutely. They, can't, they can't. It's that simple. So until someone disrupts the system and creates a reasonably priced engine, it's not going to happen. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. Great thought. Uh, gentlemen, we're, uh, we're a little over time, and I want to make sure I give each of you some time to talk about your book. And um, as I promised to the audience, I'll check in with you both afterwards to figure out how we can address some of these great questions that came in through the chat. So we'll figure out a way to get some of these answers to the folks that registered and logged in today. So thank you for your engagement, everyone. Dr. Chetapali, do you want to uh, chat about your book here, um, uh, Punish the Machine, for, for a few moments before we, um, we turn it over to Dr. Sure. Meyer? Sure. Um, the thesis of the, you know, this is from the work, the 10 years of work I've done at Kaiser Permanente. The thesis of the work is that so far we've been using technology that is, uh, I would say, slow, tedious, and dumb to have physicians use that technology. So in a way, we are punishing the physicians uh, with this uh, poor technology. When I say punish the machine, I mean, instead of punishing the doctors, we need to start punishing the machines. We need to expect a lot more from the machines. You know, in every other industry, they expect a lot more. But in healthcare, we, we kind of pamper our technology. We say, oh, no, that cannot be done. Oh, no, that cannot be done. That, you know, it's happening everywhere else. And so it's time that we, we pushed artificial intelligence, machine learning, all those technologies so that it will help the physicians rather than having the physicians do all the grunt work. Um, right on. It's available on Amazon, so feel free to check it out. Right on. And uh, th I have a copy myself. Um, very insightful, wonderful, uh, wonderful thoughts and notions in that book. So thank you for that, Dr. Chetapale. Dr. Meyer is my friend. I know you as well have a book, Digital Health and Entrepreneurship. Uh, do you want to say a few words about that? Yeah, I had the privilege of co-editing this book with uh, Sharon Wolfowich, who is now actually a med student at UC San Diego, but was at uh, Stanford at the time. And I just want to give a shout out to the authors that contributed to this. So basically, the problem this book was designed to solve was that uh, most of the listeners have an idea. They don't know what to do with it, and they're not going to be formally trained in what to do with it. So what we tried to do was put together some various chapters that kind of walk you through the process of digital health entrepreneurship and will help you either kill your idea early and avoid a lot of heartburn, or at least give you some understanding of uh, the challenges you're gonna face to get a product to go to a patient. Very good. Thanks. Nice, nice book. It is a very, very good book. Uh, it's, it's from the mind of Arlen. So always a lot of great information. <laughs> Uh, and lastly, Dr. Myers, do you want to just plug um, our, our, our wonderful sure. book group? Yeah. So if you thought this was interesting and you want to learn more, uh, we encourage you to join the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs at www.soapnet.org. Um, it's a minimal charge to join. It's $80 a year. We have an international chapter network 
We're always interested. Uh, Uli has done a great job creating and organizing and leading the San Francisco chapter. Um, we are organizing chapters all over the world, uh, Australia, uh, Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and we're hoping we'll have chapters pretty much in every continent uh, in a not too distant future. So again, education, resources, networks, mentors, experiential learning, peer-to-peer -peer support, non-clinical career development, you'll learn it all if you show up at the chapter meetings and we encourage you to join. Very good. And good. Uh, webinars like this become uh, member only content. So lots of information and resources from the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs. Uh, and with that, we're, we're nearing the end here. So I just wanted to thank uh, Dr. Chetapali and Dr. Myers for joining us today. Wonderful, wonderful presentation, wonderful content. Thank you for being engaging gentlemen as always. And uh, shout out to our, our attendees. Thank you very much for, for joining us. I know we have attendees from all over the world. So much appreciated. Stay tuned for some of the next ones. Please do um, keep your eye on uh, the SOAP website for the uh, upcoming webinars as well as in-person events. Hope Thanks you all have a wonderful much. day. Thanks very much. Thank and we'll you, see Ryan. you at the next webinar. Thank Thanks, you. everyone.